Chapter Seventeen of Beyond These Voices. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Beyond These Voices by Mary Elizabeth Braden. Chapter Seventeen father cyprian hammond returned to his comfortable rooms in the northwest region one rainy autumn evening after a long day in the dreariest abodes of east london he was almost worn out by the bodily fatigue of tramping through dismal streets with one of his friends and allies a priest from the cathedral at moorfields and by the mental strain that comes from facing the inscrutable problem of human suffering the mystery of sorrow and pain inevitable unceasing beyond man's power to help or cure he had visited the poor in great hospitals where every detail testified to the beneficence of the rich yet he knew that the comfort and cleanliness of the hospital must needs accentuate the dirt and squalor of the slum to which the patient must return he sank into his armchair with a sigh of relief and was sorry to hear of a visitor who had called twice that afternoon and would call again after nine o'clock did he leave his card yes the card was there on the table mr claude rutherford father syrian had not seen claude since the opening day of that inquest which had been so often adjourned only to close in an open verdict and a mystery still unsolved he had not seen claude but he had seen mrs rutherford more than once in that quiet month when life in west end london seemed to come to a standstill she had talked about her son as she talked only to him opening her heart to the friend who knew all its secrets the best and the worst of her hitherto she had never failed to find him interested and sympathetic but in those recent interviews it had schemed to her that if the close friend of long years had changed as if he was talking to her from a distance as if some mysterious barrier had risen between them she had told him of that conversation with her son in which he had promised to confide in this old and trusted friend that had happened more than a month ago and the confidence had not yet come perhaps it was coming to-night i will see mr rutherford at whatever time he calls father cyprian told his servant his dinner was short and temperate but not ill-cooked or ill-served he drank barley water but the jug that held it was of old cut glass picked up at a broker's shop at a back street for seven shillings and worth as many pounds his silver was old family plate his napery of the finest it was past nine when claude rutherford appeared and the first thing father cyprian observed was that he was physically exhausted he dropped into a chair with a long sigh of fatigue and it was three or four minutes before he was able to speak i knew you would have finished your spartan dinner by this time he said but i hope i am not spoiling your evening you ought to know that i have nothing better to do with my evening than to talk with any one who wants me answered the priest in a low grave voice that was like the sound of holman's bow in an adagio passage and i think you must want me or you would not come to this house a third time what have you been doing since six o'clock you look horribly fagged i have been to hampstead it is a fine night and i wanted a walk you have walked too far you are ill claude a little under the weather the modern complaint neuritis and its concomitant insomnia 
you ought to go to one of my neighbors in harley street no i want you the physician of souls this corporal frame of mine will mend itself when i get out of london a thousand miles or so do you remember the night we walked home together from portland place you pressed me very hard that evening you tried to bring me back to the fold but the time had not come and now the time has come questioned the priest pushing aside the book that he had been reading and bending forward to look into a page of human life bringing his searching eyes nearer to the haggard face in front of him yes the time has come what is the matter oh only the old disease a more acute phase the disgust of life saith he weariness of the world outside me loathing of the world inside the old disease in a variant form i want you to help me to the cure it must be heroic treatment half measures will be of no use i want you to help me to enter one of the orders that mean death to the world dominicans benedictines la trappe anything you like the harder the rule the better it may be for my soul this is strangely sudden perhaps it is an inspiration but no my dear friend not sudden the complaint is chronic and has been growing upon me for the last ten years ever since i found that i was a failure that discovery is a crisis in man's life he looks inside himself one day and finds that the fire has gone out it must all come to that life mind heart all are contained in that central fire which is the soul of a man while the fire burns he has hope he has ambition he has a future when the fire goes out he has nothing but the past the memory of things that were sweet and things that were bitter nothing but memory to live upon in all the years that are to come and he may live to be ninety a haunted man i have done with the world father cyprian am i to walk about like a dead man for ten or twenty or thirty years i have done with the world i want to give the rest of my life to the god you and my mother believe in you would not want to do that if you were not a believer i was reared in the true faith yes i believe help thou mine unbelieve i will help you with all my heart but i do not think you are of the stuff that benedictine monks are made of and it is a foolish thing to put your hand to the plow unless you have the force of mine to finish your furrow i will finish my furrow and break your mother's heart perhaps your love is all she has in this life except her religion her religion is no less a force than her love my neglect of my duties has been a grief to her she has never ceased to remonstrate with me to remind me of my boyish ardor my days of implicit faith she wants to see you return to the faith and the obedience of those days but it would distress her if you took a step that would mean separation from her that would be inconsistent after all her sermons women are apt to be inconsistent even the best of them in any case even if my mother should object which i think unlikely i have made up my mind i had time to commune with my soul in that three hours walk through the darkness i came to you this night fully resolved not to ask your advice as to the step but your help in taking it where can i go to whom can i submit myself frankly claude i am too much in the dark to help you come to me at my church tomorrow morning after mass 
with your mind more at rest and make your confession let me see into the bottom of your heart i cannot talk to a man behind a mask i can say nothing till i know all no i cannot do that i must have time i want solitude and a cell i want to shake off the husk of the world that i have lived in too long i want to be done with earthly desires i shall have a new mind when i am in my woollen gown alas claude i doubt i doubt do you remember all we talked about when you were last in this room a long time ago yes i remember you remember how i tried to awaken you to the danger of your relations with mario provana's wife those are things a man does not forget you denied the danger but you did not deny your love you gave me your assurance not as a priest but between man and man that no evil should ever come of that love yes i remember i was not afraid of myself i belong to the great army of triflers and dilettanti i am not of the stuff that passionate lovers are made of but now death has intervened and the situation is changed two years hence you might marry your cousin without shame to either without disrespect to the dead are you capable of renouncing that hope by burying yourself in a cloister are you equal to the sacrifice would there be no looking back no repentance i shall never marry my cousin vera because she does not love you is that the reason no need to enter into details or to count the cost i have made up my mind for once in my life i have a purpose and a will you seem in earnest the words came slowly like a spoken doubt and the priest's searching eyes were on the pale face in front of him the countenance wear the refinement of race a long line of well-born men and women showed in every lineament this sudden resolve of yours is inexplicable the priest continued in a troubled voice after a silence that seemed long it is not in your temperance or your manner of life since you came into a man's inheritance to cut yourself off from all that makes life pleasant to a young man with talent attractiveness and independence i would give much to know your reason for such a step haven't i told you my dear friend welt shimmers isn't that enough no it is not enough welt shimmers is the chronic disease of a decadent age if every sufferer from welt shimmers were to turn monk this world would be a monastery it is a phase in every man's life or a pose i know it is not that with you there is something behind claude something at the back of your mind something that you must tell me before i can be of any real help to you but you are your mother's son and you were steeped in sin i would do my uttermost to help you come to me the day after tomorrow i shall have had time to think over your case and you will be in a better mood for considering the situation to surrender this worldly life and all it holds is not a light thing that a man should do in a fit of the blues a man still on the sunward side of forty i who have entered my seventieth decade have no yearnings for a woolen gown i have made up my mind claude repeated in a dull dead voice the voice of an obstinate man good night end of chapter seventeen recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c
Chapter 18 of Beyond These Voices. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Painter. Beyond These Voices by Mary Elizabeth Braddon. Chapter 18. The six weeks' captivity on the hill in Sussex had been a success, and Vera was able to leave England before the first November fog descended upon Portland Place. She was in Rome, in the city where she had spent the happiest period of her life, the time in which she had first known what it meant for a woman to be adored, and lovely, and immeasurably rich. There she had first known the power of wealth, and the influence of beauty. For her husband's position and her own attractions had assured her an immediate social success, and had made her a star in Roman society during her first season, while, over and above all other graces, she had the charm of novelty. But it was not the memory of social triumphs, or of gratified vanity that was with her, as she sat alone in the too spacious saloon, or roamed with languid step through other rooms, as spacious and as lonely. Sympathy had flowed in upon her from all her Roman acquaintances, and acquaintances of diverse nationalities, the birds of passage, American, French, Spanish, German. Cards and little notes had descended upon the villa like a summer hailstorm, and she had responded with civility, but with no uncertain tone. Her mourning was to be a long mourning, and her seclusion was to be absolute. She had come to live a solitary life in her villa and gardens, to wander among ruins and steep herself in the poetry of the city. She had come not to the Rome of the present, but to the Rome of the past. This was how she explained her life to the officious people, who wanted to force distractions upon her, and who in secret were already hatching matrimonial schemes by which the Provana millions might be made to infuse new life into princely races that were perishing in financial atrophy. The Villa Provana was on high ground, beyond the Porta del Popolo, and the view from the gardens commanded the roofs and towers and cupolas of the city, and the dominating mass of the great basilica, which dwarfs all other monuments, and reduces papal Rome, with its heterogeneous roofs and turrets, steeples and obelisks, to a mere foreground for that one stupendous dome. Day after day, in those short winter afternoons, Vera stood on the terrace in front of the villa, leaning languidly against the marble balustrade, and watching the evening mists rising slowly over the city, and the grey of the great dome gradually deepening to purple, while the golden light in the west grew more intense, and orange changed to crimson. She was never tired of gazing at that incomparable prospect. How often in her honeymoon year she had stood there, with Mario Provana at her side, questioning him with a childish delight, and making him point out and explain every tower and every cupola, the classic, the papal, the old and the new, churches, palaces, public buildings, municipal and royal, picture galleries, museums, fountains. It was there, as an idolised young wife, with her husband's strong arm supporting her as she leant against him, in the pleasant fatigue after a day of pleasure, that she had learnt to know Rome, and that she had discovered how dearly the hard man of business loved the city of his birth. It was there he had told her what Victor Emmanuel and Cavour, the soldier and the statesman, had done for Italy, and how that which had been but a geographical expression, a patchwork of petty states, for the most part under foreign rulers, had become the name of a great nation in the van of progress. She thought of him now, evening after evening, 
in the unbroken silence and solitude of the long terrace on the crown of the hill, and only a little lower than the terrace on the Pincio. She looked backward across the arid desert of her five years of society under Disbrow influences, five years of life that seemed worthless and joyless compared with that year of a happiness she had almost forgotten, till her husband's death carried all her thoughts back to the past, to the time when she had given him love for love, to the days that she could think of without remorse. Oh, God, if I had died at the end of that year, what a happy life mine would have been. She thought of the tomb on the Campagna, the splendid monument of her husband's love, near which she had sat in her carriage with Mario to watch the gathering of a gay crowd and the flash of red coats against the clear blue of a December day, the hounds trotting lightly in front of huntsman and whip, the women in their short habits, patent leather boots flashing against new saddles, men on well-bred hunters, the whole picture so modern and so trivial against the fortress tomb with its mystery of a distant past, only a name to suggest the story of two lives. If I had only died then, she thought. To have ended her life in that year of gladness, innocent, beloved, while all her world was lovely in the freshness of life's morning. To have died then, before the blight of disillusion or the taint of sinful thought had touched her, to have passed out of the world, beloved and worthy of love, and to have been laid to rest in the cemetery at San Marco, beside her girlfriend. <gasps> ah, what a happy destiny! And now what was to be her doom? A cold breath touched her as she leaned over the balustrade, with her hands clasped over her eyes, a cold breath that thrilled her and made her tremble. It was only the cooler wind of evening, breathing across the gathering shadows, but it startled her by the suggestion of a human presence. She rose from the marble bench where she had been sitting since the sun began to sink behind the umbrella pines on a hill in the distance, and while the far-reaching level of the Campania began to look like the blue waters of a sea in the lessening light, and walked slowly back to the villa, by the long terrace, and under a pergola where the last roses showered their petals upon her as she passed. The lamps were lighted in the saloon, and logs were burning in the vast fireplace at the end of the room, a distant glow and brightness, a pleasing spot of colour in a melancholy picture, but of not much avail for warmth in a room of fifty feet by twenty-five, with a ceiling twenty feet high. But the comfort of the villa was not dependent upon smouldering olive logs or spluttering pine cones. There was a hot water system, the most expensive and the best, for supplying all those palatial rooms with an equable and enervating atmosphere. There was a letter lying on Vera's book table, a table that always stood by her armchair at one side of the monumental chimney-piece. This spot was her own, her island in that ocean of space. This chair was large enough to absorb her, and when she was sitting in it, the room looked empty, and a servant had to come near her table before he could be sure she was there. She took up the letter and looked at the address wonderingly. It had not come by post. There was something familiar in the writing. It reminded her of Claude's, and then, in a moment, she remembered. The letter was from Mrs. Rutherford. Little notes had been exchanged between them in past years, notes of invitation from Vera, replies, mostly courteous refusals, from the elder lady. Mrs. Rutherford must be in Rome. Strange! Had she, too, come to winter there? My dear Vera, I hear you are at your villa, living in seclusion and refusing all visits. 
but I think you will make an exception for me, as it is vital for me to see you. I am in great trouble, and I want your help badly. I shall call on you at noon tomorrow. Pray do not shut your door against me. Yours affectionately, Magdalen Rutherford. The address was of one of the smaller and quieter hotels in the great city, a house unknown to the tourist, English or American, a house patronised only by what are called nice people. Trouble? What could be Mrs. Rutherford's trouble? Had she anything in this world to be glad or sorry about, except her son? The letter gave Vera a night of agitation and feverish dreams, and she spent the hour before noon pacing up and down the great room, deadly pale in the dense blackness of her long crepe gown. It was not five minutes past the hour when Mrs. Rutherford was announced. She too was pale, and she too wore black, but not mourning. "'You are kind to let me see you,' she said, clasping Vera's hand. "'How could I refuse? I am so sorry you are in trouble. Is it?' Her voice became tremulous. "'Is it anything about Claude? Is he ill?' "'No, he is not ill, unless it is in mind. But the trouble is about him. A new and unexpected trouble. A thunderbolt!' The terror in Vera's face startled her. She thought the frail figure would drop at her feet in a dead faint, and she caught her by the arm. "'I think you may help me. You and he were great friends. Pals, Susan Amphlett called you.' "'Yes, we were pals. He was so good to me at Disbrow, years and years ago.' "'Yes, I know. He has often talked of that time. Well, you were great friends.' and a young man will sometimes open his mind more to a woman friend than he will to his mother. Did Claude ever talk to you of his church, of his remorse for his neglect of his religion, of his wanting to give up the world, to end a useless life in a monastery? Never. I thought not. It is a sudden caprice. There is no real strength of purpose in it. He is disgusted and disappointed. He has made a failure of his life, and he is angry with himself and sick to death of society. Such a man cannot go on being trivial forever. A life without purpose can but end in disgust. My poor child, you are shivering and can hardly stand. Let us go nearer the fire. Sit down and let us talk quietly. And be kind and bear with a foolish old woman who sees the joy of her life slipping away from her. The visitor's quick eye had noticed the great armchair and book table by the hearth and knew that it was Vera's place. She led her there, made her sit down and took a chair by her side. Now we shall be warm and comfortable and can look my trouble in the face. Tell me all about it. Vera said quietly, with her hand in Mrs. Rutherford's. The wave of agitation had passed. She spoke slowly, but her voice was no longer tremulous. I dare say, if you have ever thought of me in the past, you have given me credit for being a strong-minded woman. Claude has told me of your strength of will, the right kind of strength. And now I have to confess myself to you as weak, unstable, inconsistent, caring for my son's love for me more than I care for his eternal welfare. No, no, I can never believe that. But you will believe it when I tell you that he has taken the first step towards separating himself forever from this sinful world and giving the rest of his life to God, and that I am here in this city, here pleading with you to try to change his purpose and win him back to the world. Oh, said Vera with a faint cry. Has he made up his mind? He thinks he has. But, oh, what shall I do without him? It is horrible, selfish, unworthy. But I can only think of myself and my own desolate old age. 
only a few years more perhaps, only a few years of solitude and mourning, but my mind and heart rise in rebellion against fate. I cannot bear my life without him. Again and again I have urged him to remember the faith in which he was reared. I have tried to awaken him to the call of the church. I have begged Father Hammond to use his influence to rekindle the fervour of religion that has made my son's boyish mind so lovely. And now when he has gone beyond my prayers and wants to renounce this sinful world, I am a weak, miserable woman, and my despairing cry is to call him back to the life he has grown weary of. Do you not despise me, Vera? No, no, I can understand. It is natural for a mother to feel as you feel. But, all the same, I think if he has made up his mind to retire into a monastery, it is your duty to let him go. Think what it is for a man to spend his last years in reconciling himself with God. Think of the peace that may come with self-sacrifice. Think what it is to escape out of this sinful world, into a place of silence and prayer, and to know that one's sins are forgiven. He has no sins that need the sacrifice of half a life. He has been the dearest of sons, the kindest of friends, honourable, generous, straightforward. Why should he shut himself in a monastery to find forgiveness for trivial sins and neglect of religious forms? He can lead a new and better life in the world of action, where he can be of use to his fellow men. Even Father Hammond has never advised him to turn monk. He can worship God and lead the Christian life without renouncing all that is lovely in the world God made for us. Vera listened with a steadfast face, and her tones were calm and decided when she replied, Dear Mrs. Rutherford, the heart knoweth its own bitterness. I think the better you love your son, the less you should come between him and a resolve that must give him peace, if it can never give him happiness. For the first time since Mrs. Rutherford had been with her, Vera's eyes filled with tears, tears that overflowed and streamed down the colourless cheeks, and that it needed all her strength to check. "'You surprise me!' the elder woman cried passionately, flinging away the hand that she had been holding. "'You surprise me! I came to you for sympathy, sure that I should find it, believing that you cared for my son almost as much as I care for him. You were his chosen friend. He devoted half his days to you. The closeness of your friendship made malicious people say shameful things.' and has given me many an unhappy hour. And now, at this crisis of his life, when he is bent upon burying himself alive in a monastery, entering some severe order, for whose rule of hardship and deprivation he is utterly unfit, a kind of life that will break his heart and bring him to an early grave, you preach to me of his finding peace in those dreary walls. Peace, as if he were the worst of sinners." No, no, you don't understand me. Father Hammond has told me about the monastic life, the Benedictines, La Trappe. He has told me what happiness has been found in that life of solitude and prayer by those who have renounced the world. Was it you who inspired this extraordinary resolve? I? No, no, indeed. I knew nothing of it till you told me. What? He could take such a step without consulting you, without confiding in you, his closest friend. Was it likely that he would tell me if he did not tell his mother? He told me nothing till he had come here, to make a retreat in a monastery, to give himself time for meditation and thought before he took any decisive step. He is here in Rome, and has been here for some time, my first knowledge of his decision was a letter he sent me from here. Such an unsatisfactory letter, giving no adequate reason for his resolve, only vague words about his weariness of life and the world. 
What else could he say? That must always be the reason. One gets tired of everything, and then one turns to God, and a life of prayer seems best. It is death in life, but it may mean peace. Vera, I was never more shocked and disappointed. I thought you loved him when love was sin. I thought you loved him at the peril of your soul, and now, when a terrible calamity has left you free to do what you like with the rest of your life, now, when however deeply you may mourn for your husband's awful death, and grieve over any sins of omission in your married life, yet there must needs be the far-off thought of years to come, when, without self-reproach, you may give yourself to a lover who in years and temperament would be your natural companion. There has been no such thought in my mind, Vera said coldly. I shall never cease to mourn for Mario Provana's death. I have nothing else in the world to live for. My poor girl, it is only natural that you should feel like that. I did wrong to speak of the future. You have passed through a horrible ordeal, and it may be long before you can forget. But you are too kind not to be sorry for a mother who is threatened with the loss of all that she has of joy and comfort in this world. I am very sorry for you, Vera said with a mechanical air, as if her thoughts were far away. Then you will help me? Mrs. Rutherford cried eagerly. How can I help you? You can appeal to my son. You may have more influence over him than I. I believe you have more influence, with a touch of bitterness. However indifferent you may be, and may have always been to him, I know that he was devoted to you, that you could have led him, if you had cared to lead him. And he will listen to you now. He will have pity upon me, if you plead for me, if you tell him what it is for a mother to part with a son of nearly forty years cherishing, who represents all her life on earth, past, present, and to come. I cannot live without him, Vera. I thought that I was strong in faith, and patience, and resignation, till this trouble came upon me. I thought that I was a religious woman, but now I know that the God I worshipped was of clay, and that when I prayed, and tried to lift my thoughts to heaven, it was only of my son that I thought, only for his welfare that I prayed. Help me, Vera, if you have a heart that can love and sympathise with another's love. Plead with him, tell him how few the years are for a woman of my age, and that there will be time enough for him to bury himself alive in a monastery when I am at rest. His dedication of those later years will not be less precious in the sight of God, because he has deferred the sacrifice for his mother's sake. I cannot think that he will listen to me, if he has not yielded to you. I know he loves you dearly. He did love me. Never was there a better son. But he changed all at once. It was as if something had broken his life. But I think you can melt his heart. He will understand my grief better when it is brought home to him by another. I am to see him tomorrow afternoon, and I shall be allowed to take you with me. Will you come? The entreaty was so insistent, so agonising, that Vera could only bend her head in mute acquiescence. Mrs. Rutherford threw her arms round the frail figure and strained it to her breast. My dearest girl, I knew you would have pity upon me. I will call for you tomorrow at half past two. The house is on the hill, beyond the Medici Villa, a lovely spot, but to me, though it is only a place of probation, it seems like a grave. Vera, with a sudden passion, if I thought that this step were for his happiness, I believe I could submit. But when I parted with him last week, his face was the face of despair. How changed! Oh, my God, how changed! End of chapter 18
Chapter Nineteen of Beyond These Voices. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Beyond These Voices by Mary Elizabeth Braden. Chapter Nineteen mrs rutherford and vera drove to the hill behind the medici villa in the golden light of a roman november when the gardens on the height were glowing with foliage that seems made of fire and only cypress and ilex showed dark against the splendor of red and amber but to those two women all the beauty of autumn color and purple distances of fairy-like gardens and flashing fountains was part of a world that was dead the metaphysician's idea of the universe as an emanation of the individual mind is so far borne out by experience that in a great grief the universe ceases to exist the room to which one of the brotherhood led them faced the western sky and was full of golden light when the two women entered it was a room that had once been splendid but of all its splendor nothing was left but vast space and the blurred and faded outlines of a fresco upon the ceiling the two women stood within the doorway looking to the other end of the room where a solitary figure was sitting huddled in a large armchair in front of a fireplace that looked like an open tomb where a little heap of smouldering logs upon a spacious hearth seemed a hollow mockery of a fire meant for warmth that crouching form with contracted shoulders and wasted hands stretched above the feeble fire glow could that be claude rutherford vera shivered in the chillness of the dismal scene where even the vast window and the golden west could not relieve the sense of cold and gloom yes it was claude he started to his feet as mrs rutherford moved slowly along the intervening space he looked beyond her surprised at the second figure and then with one brief word to his mother hurried past her and came to vera he clasped her hands he drew her towards the window drew her into the golden light where she stood transfigured like the madonna in a picture by fra angelico glorious and old gold he looked at her as a traveller who had been dying of thirst in a desert might look at a fountain of clear water it was a long long look in which it seemed as if he were drinking the beauty of the face he looked at as if in those moments he tried to satisfy the yearning of days and nights of severance it seemed as if he could never cease to look as if he could never let her go then suddenly he dropped her hand and turned from her to his mother who was standing a little way off why have you done this he asked vehemently because you would not listen to me no prayers no tears of mine would move you i was breaking my heart and i thought she might prevail when i failed i knew her influence over you and that she might move you it was a cruel thing to do i knew she was in rome that we were breathing the same air the thought of her was with me by day and night yet i was rock i made myself iron i clung to the cross like the saints of old time who had all been sinners vera why have you come between me and my god i could not see your mother so unhappy and refuse to do what she asked oh claude forget that i came here forget that we have ever clasped hands since since you resolved to separate yourself from the world 
I will not come between you and that saving of your soul. Vera, Mrs. Rutherford cried passionately, have you no compassion for me? Is this how you help me? You know that I refused, that I did not want to see him. I ought never to have come. But it is over. We shall never meet again, Claude. This is the last, the very last. Heartless girl, have you no thought of my grief? urged the mother. No, not when I think of him. If you can come between him and his hope of heaven, I cannot. She turned and walked quickly to the door without another word. Mrs. Rutherford cast one despairing look at her son before she followed the vanishing figure, muttering, Cruel, cruel, a heart of stone. No words were exchanged between the two women as they left the monastery, conducted by the monk who had waited for them in the stony corridor at the top of the broad marble stairs. He let them out of the heavy iron-lined door into the neglected garden, where a long row of cypresses showed dark against a saffron sky. The greater part of the garden had been utilized for glowing vegetables upon which the brotherhood for the most part subsisted. Huge orange-red pumpkins sprawled among the beds of kale, and patches of Indian corn were golden amidst the rusty green of artichokes gone to seed. It was a melancholy place, and the aspect of it sent an icy chill through Mrs. Rutherford's heart as she thought of that light, airy temperament which had been her son's most delightful gift the gay insolence the joyous outlook that had made him everybody's favorite he the jester the trifler for whom life was always playtime he to be shut within those frozen walls immured in a living grave it was maddening even to think of it she had talked to him of his religious duties oh god was it her old woman's preaching that had brought him to this living death? Vera bade her good-bye at the gate, saying that she would rather walk than drive, and left Mrs. Rutherford to return to her hotel alone. I wonder which of us two is the more unhappy, she thought. Why do I wonder? What is her misery measured against mine? For Claude... A night of fever followed that impassioned meeting, a night of sleeplessness and semi-delirium. For the first time since he had been a visitor in that house of gloom, he got up at two o'clock and went to the chapel, where the monks met for prayer and meditation at that hour. As a probationer making his retreat, he was not subject to the severe rules of the order, and he need not leave his bed till four o'clock unless he chose this night he went to the dimly lighted chapel and knelt on the chill stone for respite from agonizing thoughts from the insidious whispers of the tempter this night he went into the house of god to escape from the domination of satan hitherto he had borne his time of probation with a stolical submission he had sought no relaxation of the rule for penance on the threshold he had lain upon the narrow bed and shivered in the chilly room and risen in the winter dark to lie down again sleepless at an hour when a little while ago his night of pleasure would have been still at full tide he had submitted to the repellent fare, the vegetables cooked in half rancid oil, coarse bread and gritty coffee. He, who had been always a creature of delicate habits, accustomed to the uttermost refinement in every detail of daily life, his food, his toilet, his surroundings. He had shrunk from no burden that was laid upon him. 
earnestly intent upon keeping his promise to father hammond he was to spend six weeks in this place of silence and prayer and at the end of that time he was to make his confession to the superior and to make his communion then would follow the slow stages of preparation for the final act which would admit him to the brotherhood and shut the door of the world upon all the rest of his life he had learnt to think of that awful change with a stoic's resignation he had brought himself to a roman temper he thought with indifference of the world which he was to renounce he had done with it this had been the state of his mind as he shivered over the smouldering olive logs this iron calm and his stony contempt for life had been his till that moment of ecstasy when the woman he loved stood before him a vision of ethereal beauty in the light of the setting sun why had she come there why the pentennial days and nights the stoic's iron resolve all were gone in one breath from those sweet lips faint and pale but ineffably beautiful end of chapter nineteen recording by linda Marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter number twenty two of beyond these voices this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c beyond these voices by mary elizabeth braden chapter twenty two it was a little less than three weeks after the meeting in the house of silence but to vera the interval seemed an endless pro procession of but to vera the interval seemed an endless procession of slow gray days and fevered nights nights of intolerable length in which she listened to the beating of the blood against her skull now slow and rhythmical now temptuous and irregular endless lights endless nights in which sleep seemed the most unlikely thing that could happen a miracle for which she had left off hoping in all that time she had heard no more of mrs rutherford though the daily chronicle that kept note of every stranger in rome still printed her name among the inmates of the hotel still printed her name among the inmates of hotel margarita she was angry and unforgiving unhappy mother unhappy son two pairs of horses had to be exercised daily but vera had no orders for the stables the monotonous parade in the pincio which every other woman of means in rome made a part of her daily life had no attraction for signor provenna's wife the villa gardens funeral in their winter foliage of ilex and arbutus sufficed for relief from their long hours within four walls wrapped in her sable coat with the wind blowing upon her uncovered head she paced the long terraces for hours on end or sat like a statue on the marble bench that had been dug out of the ruins of imperial baths but though she spent half her days in the gardens she took no interest in them she never stopped to watch the gardeners at work upon the flower beds never questioned them about their preparations for the spring thousands of bulbs were planted daily but she never wanted to learn what resurrection of vivid colors would come from those brown balls which the men were dropping into the earth she walked about like a corpse alive the men almost shrank from her 
as she passed them as if they had seen a ghost she never she could never forget that last meeting with her lover the last the very last she sat with her arms folded on the marble balustrade and her head resting on the folded arms with her face hidden from the clear cold light of a december afternoon her gaze was turned inward and it was only with that inward gaze that she saw things distinctly the outside world was blurred and dim but the pictures memory made were vivid she saw claude's agonized she saw claude's agonized look saw the melancholy eyes gazing at her the yearning love the despairing renunciation mrs rutherford had called her cruel but was not the cruelty far greater than submitted her to that heart-rendering ordeal to sit brooding thus with her arms upon the cold marble had been so much a habit with her of late that in these melancholy reveries she had often lost count of time till the sound of some convent bell startled her as it told the lateness of the hour or till the creeping cold of sundown awoke her with a shiver in that city of the church there were many bells all with their particular call to prayer and she could have told the progress of the day and night without the help of a clock now it was the bell of the trinita de mont for the office of benediction distant and silvery sweet in the clear air it was a warning to go back to the house yet she did not stir solitude here with the cold wind blowing up upon her and the twitter of birds among the branches was better than the atmosphere of those silent rooms she raised her head at the sound of a footstep not the leisurely tread of one of the gardeners heavy and slow this step was light and rapid so rapid that before she had time to wonder it had stopped close beside her and two strong arms were holding her and quick sobbing breath was fluttering in her hair don't be frightened vera my angel my beloved she tried to release herself tried to stand upright but the passionate arms held her to the passionate heart claude are you mad no madness is over sanity has come back i am yours my beloved yours as i was that night before a great horror parted us i am all your own your lover your husband whatever you will the miserable slave you saw in the monastery is dead i am yours and only yours i have no separate existence i no i want no i want no other heaven heaven is here in your arms nothing else matters my god have you left the monastery forever i bore it till last night but that was a night of hell i told the superior this morning that i was not of the stuff that makes a martyr or monk he was horrified to him i seemed a son of the devil well i will worship satan sooner than lose you i am your lover vera nothing else in this sublurny world will jump the life to come she clung to him in the ecstasy of reunion and their lips met in a kiss more tragic than francisca's and paulo's for their guilt was yet to come while with vera and her lover guilt had been consummated presently with a sudden revolution presently with a sudden revulsion she snatched herself from his arms and stood looking at him reproachfully oh my dearest why did you not stand firm 
think how little this poor life of ours means compared with that which some comes after think how much this poor life of ours means compared with that which comes after i leave the afterlife to the illuminated to simon and his following i want nothing but the woman i love here or hereafter for me there is nothing else vera forget that i ever tried to forsake you that i ever set my soul's ransom above my thoughts of you it was a short madness a cowardly endeavor forget it all as i shall from this hour here you are and i in the little world which is the only one we know just with just a few more years of youth and love let us make the most of them and when the fire of life dies down when these fierce heart throbs are over we will give our fading years to penance and prayer we will give our fading years to penance and prayer this is what happens when a man of claude rutherford's temperament puts his hand to the plow end of chapter twenty recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter twenty one of beyond these voices this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c beyond these voices by mary elizabeth braden chapter twenty one just two years after the sudden close of mr rutherford's retreat there was a quiet wedding in father hammond's chapel a bride without bridesmaids a marriage without music a bride in a pale grey gown and a black hat with just a sprinkling of the disbrow clan to keep her in countenance three stately aunts lady oakhampton being by far the most human of the three and their three noble husbands with lady susan amphit vivacious as ever and immensely pleased with her friend from a conversational point of view she had been living upon this marriage all through the little season of november fog and small dinner parties at restaurants or at home she knew so much more than anybody else and what she knew was what everybody wanted to know she discussed the subject at ritz's at claridge's at the savoy at the carlton and seemed to have something fresh to say at each place of entertainment there was more variety in her information than even in the hors d'oeuvres which rise in a crescendo of novelty in unison with the newness of the hotel people wondered they had not married sooner since of course everybody knew it must end in marriage susie shrugged her pretty shoulders and flashed her diamond necklace at the company the sweet thing is exalté she is one of francis simon's flock and she thought respect for her husband obliged her to wait two years she only left off her mourning last week but considering that she was carrying on with rutherford years before provana's death you none of you understand her their friendship was purely platonic she and i were like sisters and i was in and out of her house just as claude was there never was a more innocent attachment i used to call them paul and virginia i should think paolo and francesca would be more like it murmured one of the company susie shook her fan at him you men will never believe in a virtuous friendship however 
there they are absolutely devoted to each other they will be the happiest couple in london and they mean to entertain a great deal then i hope they are on the lookout for a pearl among chefs people won't go to portland place to eat second-rate dinners provana's dinners were admirable and his wines the finest in london then there came the question of settlements how much of her millions had mrs provana settled upon rutherford i don't think there has been any settlement the more fool he muttered a matter-of-fact guardsman what's the use of marrying a rich woman if you don't get some of the stuff don't i tell you they are like paul and virginia said susie the provana murder had died out long before this as a source of interest and wonder it had flourished and faded like a successful novel or play that takes the town by storm one year and is forgotten the year after the provana mystery has gone to the dust heap of old things slowly and gradually people had resigned themselves to the knowledge that this murder must take its place among the long list of crimes that are never to be punished by the law romantic people clung to their private solutions of the tragical enigma these were as sure of the identity of the murderer as if they had seen him red-handed the quiet marriage in the roman catholic chapel revived the interest in the half-forgotten crime and lady susan had the additional kudos of a close association with the event vera and i were together at lady fulham's ball within two or three hours of that poor fellow's death she told her friends at the savoy supper-table i never saw her look so lovely in one of her mermaid frocks and a neckline and girdle of single diamonds that flashed like water drops other people's jewels looked vulgar compared with hers she was in wonderful spirits stayed late and danced all the after-supper waltzes she was fay rutherford was there of course said someone of course echoed susan why shouldn't he be there everybody was there but everybody couldn't waltz or sit out with madame provana all the evening as i heard he did remarked a middle-aged matron fixing susan with her long-handled eyeglass why shouldn't they waltz they are cousins and have always been pals and they waltz divinely to watch them is to understand what shakespeare meant by the poetry of motion everything vera does is a poem every frock she wears shows that she is a poet's daughter and now they are married and are going to be utterly happy concluded susie with conviction the word in general does not relish that idea of idyllic happiness especially in the case of multi-millionaires it is consoling when one is not a millionaire to think of some small counterbalance to that overweening good luck some little rift within the loot a cynic as cold and sour as the aspect he was eating shrugged his shoulders if i had a daughter i was fond of i don't think i would trust the chances of her happiness to claude rutherford he said quietly claude is quite adorable said a fourteen-stone widow whose opulent shoulders and triple necklaces had been the center point of the public gaze at the theatre that evening much too adorable to make one woman happy a man of that kind has to spread himself it might be diffused light not the concentrated glow of the domestic hearth said the cynic smiling at the bubbles in his glass everybody found something to say about vera and her husband certainly their behavior since provana's death had been exemplary they had never been seen about together at home or abroad 
The house in Portland Place had been closed, and the widow had lived in Italy, a recluse, seeing no one. Half the time had been spent by Claude Brutherford in Africa, hunting big game with a famous sportsman, the other half in well-known studios in Antwerp and Paris. He had thrown off his lazy, dilettante habits, and had gone in for art with a curious renewal of energy. The man was altered somehow. His own acquaintance discovered a change in him, a change for the better, most likely, though they did not all think so. And now he had attained the summit of moral bliss, as possible to a man of nine and thirty, who had wasted the morning of his life. He had won a lovely woman whom he was supposed to adore, and whose wealth ought to be inexhaustible. However hard he tries, I don't see how he can run through such a fortune as that, his friends said. That kind of quiet, unpretentious man has often a marvellous facility for getting rid of money, said another. It oozes out of his pockets without the labour of spending. Rutherford is sure to gamble. A man of that temperament is too idle to find excitement for himself. He wants it ready-made, at the back current table, or on the turf. Well, it will last him a few years, at the worst, and then he can go into the charter house. The idea of Claude Rutherford going to bed at ten o'clock in the charter house made everybody laugh. The long interval of mourning and probation, of melancholy solitude on Vera's part, and of forced occupation on Claude's was over, and they too, who in thought and feeling had been long one, were now united in that closer bond which only death or sin can sever. In the intensity of the union, it seemed to them as if they had never lived as under, as if all of their existence that had gone before were no more than a long, dull dream, the grey monotony of life that was less than life, hard and mechanical, even in its so-called pleasures. I never lived till now, she told him, when she was folded to his heart, in their sumptuous alcove in the great room in Venice, in an hotel that had been a palace, an alcove surrounded with a balustrade, a bed that had been made for a king. I never lived till now, for now I know that nothing can part us. We belong to each other till death. If it were now to die, t'were now to be most happy, he murmured, in a low, impassioned voice that soothed her like music. And the past is dead, she whispered. The past is dead. The voice that echoed her words had changed. The winter moonlight set a flood of cold light across the shining floor, and the glow of burning logs on the hearth glimmered redly under the sculptured arc of the byzantine fireplace it was a wonderful room in a wonderful city vera had never been in venice till this night when she stepped from the station quay into the black boat that was to bring them to the hotel man and maid and luggage following in a second gondola to most travellers so arriving Venice must needs seem a dream city, but to Vera all life had been a dream since she stood before the altar and heard Father Hammond's grave voice pronounce the words that made her Claude's wife. She had chosen Venice for their honeymoon, because it was one famous city in her beloved Italy in which she had never been with Provana. It will be all new and strange, she told Claude, and then came the unspoken thought. He will not be there. He had been with her in Rome, almost an inseparable companion, until she had grown accustomed to the thought 
that he must be with her always what whenever she went an inseparable shadow but with her marriage the bond that held her to the past was broken the shadow was lifted she was young again young and thoughtless living in the exquisite hour almost happy as she had been when she was an impulsive light-hearted child of eleven leaping on to her cousin's knee and nestling with her arms round his neck while they watched the waves racing towards the rock where they were sitting she rather hoping that the waters would rise round them and swallow them that blue brightness could hardly mean death they would only become part of the sea merman and mermaid children of the ocean how much better than to return to the dull lodgings and lidcott's harsh dominion that solitude of two in the loveliest city in europe seemed altogether of the stuff that dreams are made of they kept no count of the days and hours they made no plan for to-morrow they wandered along the call and in and out of the churches in a desultory and casual way looking at pictures and statues without any precise knowledge of what they were seeing only a dreamy delight in things that were beautiful themselves and which awakened ideas of beauty they spent idle days in their gondola going from island to island musing among the historic arches of torcello or sauntering along the sands of the lido the winter was mild even in england and here soft air and sunshine suggested april rather than december it was a delicious world and in the seclusion of a gondola or in the half-light of a church they seemed to have this lovely world all to themselves they were very strangers in venice at this season and the residents had something more to do than to wander about the narrow call or loiter and look at things in the churches or the dodges place these two were leaning these two were learning venice by heart in those leisurely saunterings a little listless sometimes as of people whose lives had come to a dead stop they never talked of the past or only of that remote past when vera was a child the time of childish happiness by the blue waves and the dark cliffs of north devon they talked very little of the future their talk was of themselves and of their love they read byron and shelley and browning and de musset they drank deep of the poetry that venice had inspired until every stone in the city of dreams seemed enchanted and every noble old mansion given over perhaps now to commerce glass-blowers and dealers in brick a brack seemed a fairy place they drained the cup of life and love claude forgot that he had ever thought of the woollen gown and the hempen girdle vera forgot that she had ever seen him haggard and hollow-eyed crouching over the smouldering olive logs in the monastery on the roman hill early on their wedding journey leaning against the side of the boat hand locked in hand they had sworn to each other that all the past should be forgotten come what come might in unknown fate they would never remember and now they were going back to london in the gay spring season and lady susan amphit had other innings had another innings it was delicious to be moving about in a world where everybody wanted to know things that only she could tell them and are they really going to live in the house in portland place really really where could they get such rooms such air and space and that old italian furniture is priceless there is nothing better in the doria palace 
it took the provana family more than a century to collect it even with their wealth well when i saw the painters at work outside i thought the house must have been sold this world seems full of strange people how vera can reconcile herself to live in that house passes my comprehension i could understand her keeping the furniture but to live inside those four walls i should fancy they were closing in upon me like a medieval torture chamber vera is all poetry and imagination but she is not morbid vera knows that we are in the midst of the unseen and that our dead are always near us said a thrilling voice and lady fanny ransom's dark eyes flashed across the table the house can make no difference to her if she loved her first husband she has not lost him nice for her but not so pleasant for the second murmured a matter-of-a-fact k c she was utterly devoted to poor provana protested susie but it was the reverent looking up kind of love that an innocent girl feels for a man old enough to be her father she has told me the story of their courtship so sweet like paul and virginia a middle-aged paul i thought rutherford was the hero of the paul and virginia chapter of her history oh well they were little lovers as children and vera and claude are the most ideal couple that ever the world has seen they are going to entertain in a sumptuous style their house will be the most popular in london in spite of its being the scene of an unsolved mystery and undiscovered crime that's the worst of it said sour middle aged in a garnet necklace for my part i could never sleep a wink in that awful house ah but you'll be able to eat and drink in it remarked mr horentius k c dryly we shall all dine there if the dinners are good as they were in poor provana's time poor provana that was his epitaph in the world on the marble tomb at st marco to which the dead man had been carried in remembrance of a desire expressed in those distant days when he and vera wandered in the olive woods there was nothing but his name and one word reunited vera had been too ill and too much under the dominion of lady oakenhampton to make the dismal journey with her dead but she now had gone from rome to san marco and spent a melancholy hour in that secluded corner where the cypress cast its long shadow on gulina's tomb she had stood by the tomb in a kind of stupor hardly conscious of the present lost in a long dream of the past living again through those bright april days with father and daughter and hearing again the ineffable tenderness in mario provana's voice as he talked to his dying child what an abyss of time since those sad sweet days and now there was nothing left but a name mario provana here and in certain hospitals in london and rome where there were wards or beds established in memory of Mario Provana. End of chapter 21. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 22 of Beyond These Voices. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Beyond These Voices by Mary Elizabeth Bryden, Chapter Number Twenty Two. Mrs. Rutherford was the fashion in the first year of her second marriage. 
just as she had been in her london debut as madame provana it seemed as if one of the fairies at her christening had given her that inexpressible charm which captivates the crowd that elusive indescribable attractiveness which for want of a better name people have agreed to call magnetism vera rutherford was a magnetic woman mr simon went about telling people that she had psychic attributes which removed her worlds away from the normal woman and miranda the only the only the imitable dressmaker told her patroness that it was a delight to work for mrs rutherford not because she was rich enough to pay for the wildest flights in millinery but because her pale ethereal beauty lent itself to all that was daring and original in the dress designer's art people preached to me about mrs monsieur's lovely colouring and what a joy it must be to invent frocks for her but those pink and white beauties are difficult said the dressmaker they require much study a nuance just the faintest nuance on the wrong side and your pink and white woman looks vulgar a wrong shade of blue and the peach complexion becomes purple but with mrs rutherford's alabaster skin every scheme of color is possible mrs rutherford was a social success just as madame provana had been her entertainments were as frequent and as sumptuous as in the old days when mario provana stalked like a stranger through crowded rooms where hardly one face in twenty afforded him a moment's interest the entertainments were as sumptuous but they were more original the tone was lighter and gilded youth from the embassies found the house more amusing vera is ten years younger since her second marriage lady susie told people cloud aids and abets her in everything frivolous she used to be just a little too dreamy oh you may call it side but that it never was but she is certainly more sociable now more eagerly interested in the things that interest other people claude has made her forget that she is a poet's daughter she is as keen as mustard about their house and racing stables at newmarket she goes to all the big cricket matches with him things she never thought of in provana's time they are not like commonplace husband and wife but like boy and girl lovers pleased with everything i don't wonder if mr simon thinks she has degenerated he says she is losing her other world look and is fast becoming a mere mortal and as a mere mortal i hope she won't allow rutherford to spend all her money says susie's confident an iron-gray bachelor of fifty who spent the greater part of his life sitting in pretty woman's pockets a racing stud is a pretty deep pit for gold at the best but a man who has married a triple millionaire's widow may safely allow himself one hobby rutherford goes in for too many things his dirigible balloons and his aeroplane his racing cars and his motor launches his austin holiday where people say he is hardly ever out of the gambling rooms your friend has better keep an eye on her passbook vera cried susie with uplifted eyebrows vera look at a passbook as a banker's widow she might be supposed to know that there are such financial thermometers she must have learnt something of business from provana she never took the slightest interest in his business and he was far too noble to degrade her by talking of money a pity said the bachelor when a woman's husband is a great financier he may want to talk about money 
and his wife ought to be interested in things that are of vital concern for him that's a counsel of perfection said susie and very few women rise to it all i have ever known about my husband is that he is interested in railways and insurance companies and things and that when any of them are going wrong i better not talk of my dressmaker's bills or let him see my passbook then you know what a passbook is i have to sighed susie for my normal state is an overdrawn account i think the letters n e and n s are quite the horridest in the alphabet yet you never ask a friend to help you out of a fix not much when it comes to that i shall make a mistake in measuring my dose of chloral and it will be poor susan umflit death by misadventure susan who had never had an adventure or affairs of her own was a kind of modern representative of the chorus in a greek play and was always explaining people more especially her bosom friends of whom vera was the dearest she was really fond of vera and there was no erect pence of envy and malice in her explanations her intense interest in other people may perhaps be attributed to the fact she hardly ever opened a book not even the novel of the season and that her knowledge of public events was derived solely from the talk at luncheon tables certainly it might be admitted even by the malicious that claude and vera were an ideal couple they outraged all modern custom in spending the greater part of their lives in close companionship he originating all their amusements and she keenly interested in everything he originated they were happy and they were continually telling each other how happy they always went back to the childish days at disbrow i feel as if all that ever happened after that was blotted out vera whispered one sunlit afternoon as they sat side by side among silken cushions on the motor launch while all the glory of the upper thames moved past them all between those summer days and those seams vague and dim even the long years with poor granny the wailing about want of money the moaning over the things we had to do without the people she hated because they were rich all those years and the years that came after have gone down into the gulf of forgotten things a dark curtain like a pall has fallen upon the past and we are living in the present we love each other and we are together that is enough claude is it not that is enough that is enough he echoed smiling at her from his lower level among the pillows that heap of down pillows and his lounging attitude among them seemed to epitomize the man and his life all the same i want sinbad the second to win the ledger ah you always laugh at me she cried with a vexed air you can never be serious no i can't he answered with a darkening brow and a voice that was as heavy as lead they were living upon the rapture of a consummated love which is something like a rich man living upon his capital there comes a time when he begins to ask himself how long it will last they had loved each other for years first unconsciously with a divine innocence at least on the woman's part then consciously and with a vague sense of sin and then all obstacles being removed triumphantly assured of the long future in which nothing could part them she repeated this often in impassioned moments nothing can part us whatever fate may bring we shall be together there can be no more parting 
He was not given to serious thoughts. He never had been. His one irresistible charm had been his careless enjoyment of the present hour and indifference to all that might come after. He had never considered the ultimate result of any action in his life. He left the army with no more thought than he left off a soiled glove. He threw up a painter's art and all its chances of delight and fame the moment he found disencouragement and difficulty he hated difficult things he hated hard work he hated giving up anything he liked his haunting idea of evil was the dread of being bored once vera found herself making an involuntary comparison between the dead man and the living if claude had a dying daughter whom he loved could he have watched her sink into her grave and kept the secret of his sorrow and smiled at her while his heart was breaking she knew he could not he was a creature of light and variable moods of sunshine and fine weather she had loved him for his lightness he had brought her relief from ennui whenever he crossed her threshold he had brought her gladness and gay thoughts as a man brings a bunch of june roses to his sweetheart and now that the past was done with and that she was his forever they were to be always glad and gay there was to be no gloom in the atmosphere no long dull pause in life to give time for dark thoughts everybody has something to be sorry for vera told susan amphlett that's why people's existence is a perpetual rush niagara can have no time to think but imagine if nature were alive what long aching thoughts there might be under the bosom of a great smooth lake you know my darling vera i generally think everything you do is perfect susan answered more sensibly than her wont but i sometimes fear that you and claude are burning the candle at both ends you are too much alive you seem to be running a race with time neither your health nor your beauty can last at the pace you are going i'll take my chance of that there is one thing that i dread more than being ill and growing ugly what is that living to be old what you've caught my fear i dread the long slow years the long slow days and sleepless nights old people sleep very little in which there is nothing but thought an endless web of miserable thoughts going slowly round and round never stopping never changing that's what i am afraid of susie strange for you to be afraid of anything her friend said thoughtfully i think you are the most courageous woman i have ever heard of as brave as joan of arc or charlotte corday why because you are not afraid to live in this house why not what does the house matter it must make you think sometimes faltered susan i won't think but if i were to think of the past the house would make no difference my thoughts would be the same in mexico or at the north pole i have heard of people who go to the end of earth to forget things but i should never do that i should know that memory would go with me For three seasons in London, for three winters in Rome, the pace went on, and was accelerated rather than slackened with the passing of the years. Claude Rutherford won the blue ribbon of the turf, with Sinbad the second, and was equally fortunate with his boat at Cowes. If he did not cross the Channel or fly from London to Liverpool, he did at least make sundry costly excursions in the air which kept his name in the daily papers 
and made his wife miserable till aviation having resulted in boredom he promised to content himself with the substantial earth after those three years this boy and girl couple began to discover that they had done everything brilliant and exciting that there was to be done and the fever called living began to pall and now susan amphlett told people that vera was killing herself and that her husband though as passionately in love with her as ever he had been was selfish and thoughtless and was spending her money and ruining her health with the extravagances and agitations of a racing stable that was on a scale he ought never to have allowed himself after all it is her money said susan and it's bad form on his part to be so reckless but as she has only a life interest in provana's millions and as her trustees are some of the sharpest business men in london rutherford can't do her much harm said masculine common sense while feminine malice was lifting its shoulders and eyebrows with doleful prognostics well i suppose the money is all right said chorus still inclined to be tragic it's her health i'm afraid of she's losing her high spirits her joy in everything and she is getting out of touch with her husband she could hardly give him a smile when blue rose won the oaks she sat in a corner of her box looking the other way while that lovely animal was coming down the hill neck and neck with the favorite at a moment when any other woman would have been simply frantic she is not of the stuff that racing men's wives are made of says eustace lyon the poet no doubt she was worlds away in dreamland and did not even know whose mare the bookies and the mob were cheering she was not like that two years ago says chorus she and claude were in such perfect sympathy that it was impossible for either of them to have a joy that the other did not share it was a case of two souls with but a single thought i can quite believe that for i never gave c r credit for thinking replied the poet say it he had come it came in a day the fatal day that comes to all the favored and the fortunate and which never comes to the poor and the unlucky that evil least is spared to nature's stepchildren they never have too much of anything except debt and difficulty they never yawn in each other's faces and ask themselves where they can go for the summer they never turn over the leaves of a continental bradshaw and complain that they are tired of everywhere it is the people who can go everywhere and have everything who find the wide earth a garden run to seed and feel the dust of the desert in their mouths as they talk of the pleasure places that the herd long for this time has come for vera at the end of her third season as claude rutherford's wife he the gay and the insouciant was careless still but it was a new kind of carelessness the carelessness that comes from hating everything that an exhausted life can give they had fallen into the fashion of their friends of late and were more like the normal semi-detached couple than the boy and girl lovers upon whose bliss lady susan had loved to expatiate when the good wood week came round in this third year with the inexorable regularity that one finds in the events of the season vera declared that she had enough of goodwood and would never go there again of course that won't prevent your being there she said well not exactly when i have isuit of ireland in two races yes of course you must be there i forgot you seem always to forget my horses nowadays yet you were once so keen about them 
They were very interesting at first, poor sweet things, but the fonder I was of them, the more cruel it seemed to race them. You'd like them kept to look at, eh? I should like to sit with them in their boxes, and feed them with sugar, and make them lie down with their heads in my lap. A lady rarely. I sometimes long for a paradise of animals, some lovely pastoral valley, with the silver stream winding through the deep grass, where I might live among beautiful innocent creatures, sheep and deer, and Jersey cows, and great calm cream-colored oxen from the Campania, creatures that can lie in the sun and bask, knowing nothing of the past, feeling nothing but the warmth and beauty of the world, and where I myself should have lost the faculty of thought that's a queer fancy i have many queer fancies they come to me in dreams you'd much better come to goodwood all the world will be there and you'd like to see insuit win haven't you enough frocks is that the reason for not coming i have too many frocks some that i have never worn hansel them at lady waterby's you'll be the prettiest woman there it's dear of you to say that her eyes clouded as she spoke but i can't go i'm so tired of it all claude so tired do you suppose i am never tired of things sick sick to death but i know that to be happy one must keep moving that's a law of human life you better come vera you'd be moped to extinction alone don't mind loneliness and i shall have susan part of the time and there will be a meeting in the albany digustibius well if you prefer simon and his spooks to a racecourse in an old english park there's nothing more to be said he stooped to kiss the pale forehead before he sauntered out of the room yawning as he went he had always a tired air but it had verily because a law of his being to keep moving nemesis is like the policeman on night duty he used to say she won't let us lie in the dust and sleep we must trudge on trudging from one costly pleasure to another might not suggest hardship to the loafer on the embankment but to a self-indulgent worldling who has drained the cup of life to the dregs that necessity of going on drinking when there are only the dregs to drink may seem hard to bear end of chapter twenty two recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c